We have a special guest speaker, Joe Simon, will be uh, preaching from Revelation 3. And Joe, come on out, come on out here. So excited to have Joe sharing again. And uh, this is one of his specialties, and I'm going to pray for you. I'll pray to get Joe started, okay? Yeah, Father, we just thank you for the worship. And now, Lord, we just pray that you would empower Joe as he battles through colds and lots of other things. Lord, just pray that you would empower him to share your word. And I pray if anybody is not ready for Jesus Christ to come back again yet, whether because they haven't put their faith in him yet, that today would be that day, or whether that our lives aren't need to be put in order, that today would be the start of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. Thank you. And good morning to everybody. Um, the text today is uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. It is the last of the seven churches that Jesus addresses in chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. It is the harshest criticism of any of the seven churches. The church of Laodicea has been called the apostate church. This is not a feel-good sermon. Uh, this is not uh, a positive, if you want to coin a phrase, this is not a positive message in the sense that uh, it's going to make you feel good. Um, there is a lot of conviction in this message. So I'm going to tell you why I've chosen this. I chose this message because this past week, in one of my small group Bible studies, I taught from this text. And that is the reason why I chose this. Pastor Chuck had asked me to teach on March 12th, and so I'm here, and my rule of thumb is the best thing I'm prepared for is the last thing I taught. And so this was the last message that I taught, and that is why I chose it. I didn't just pick it out of out of a random amount of subjects because I have an agenda to really scream at the church and rebuke the church. It's not, this is not a personal uh, choice. This is where I was in the scripture when I was scheduled to teach in this church. Just for those who may question my motivation for bringing this message today. Um, so let's get into the, the scripture. And uh, I, I would like to add a little more prayer before I start. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this message. We thank you, Lord, that you love the church, even when the church is not in love with you, even when the church is apostate, even when the church is rebellious, even when the church is worldly. We thank you, Lord, that you love us even when we don't love you. And Lord, we pray that we would have ears to hear as your, as your word says, and that we would listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. And Lord, we, we pray that um, we would not harden our hearts. We pray that we would not be defensive, that we would have uh, hearts uh, that would be willing to receive rebuke, receive criticism. Lord, that we would take this message and share it with others that need to hear it, those that are not tuned in to this live stream or will not find the video on YouTube or, or, or the church website uh, after it's posted. I pray, Lord, that people will share this message because the most important thing, Lord, is that you are feared that you are glorified and that you are worshiped. And that if the church is not doing that, the church needs to listen to your rebuke, to your warning, because you love the church and you want the church to be with you for all of eternity. So I pray that that will touch the hearts and minds of people listening today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The church of Laodicea, the word Laodicea means the people ruling, so that's a very apropos name. Let's see what Jesus says to the church of Laodicea. To the, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, 
the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one of the either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The apostate church, they say that they are rich. They say that they have need of nothing. That would include Jesus. Now, you might not say outwardly, a church might not say outwardly, we don't need Jesus. But Resisting the word of God when it's appropriate, when, not, when compromising the word of God, when compromising the teachings of Christ, you are rejecting Christ. You are rejecting Christ's leadership. You are rejecting Christ as the standard of the church. Apostasy is a very, very serious infraction. Apostasy is departing from the truth that one claims to have. So you claim that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. You claim that you have faith in Christ. You claim that you go to a church that believes in Jesus Christ. And yet, you genuinely don't believe that and you genuinely don't behave in a way that is obedient to Christ. Going through the, each one of these verses, um, he says to, to the angel in the church of Laodicea, that could be the pastor, that could, uh, people say, well, it, it could be a real angel. Um, Jesus is instructing John to write a letter to the church of Laodicea, and he starts out to the angel of the church of Laodicea, and nowhere in scripture does God ever send an actual angel a letter. So this is probably the leader of the pastor or the leader of the Laodicean church. What is, who is the Laodicean church? Who are they? Well, at the time of, of John writing the book of Revelation, um, they were an actual church. Not only were they an actual church, but in Colossians chapter 2, during the time Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians, we find out that Laodicea was actually a faithful church, was actually one, uh, a church that uh, was obedient. This may have been about 30 years before John uh, took this dictation from Jesus. Uh, he says, uh, I want you to know that I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they become that may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches, notice the wording here, full riches of complete understanding, full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom, all, in whom are hidden all the treasures, treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul, writing 30 years before John, uses this language of riches and treasures. And 30 years later, Jesus is using the same language to that church. And he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot or cold nor hot. We'll come back to that. 
I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. See, now Paul had said that they were rich in the treasures of Christ. But this church had become apostate. They had, they had become rich. They had become so rich that the historical narrative is, is that there was an earthquake in Laodicea uh, at some time. They were part of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, the Roman government, offered uh, assistance to rebuild Laodicea. And their official response was, we are rich. We, we have need of nothing. We will rebuild our own city. And Jesus is using that language here. You say that you are rich, that you have acquired wealth, and you do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So immediately, your mind may be going to these churches, and they do exist, where the measure of your faith is your bank account, your house, the kind of car you drive, the expensive clothes you wear, and so on and so on and so on. And that's, that's definitely apostasy, when you're, you somehow equate your faith with worldly goods. Um, Jesus is definitive here that that is not a measure of spirituality. Certainly God blesses people of faith. So in no way am I saying that if you are wealthy, and if you live in the United States and you're middle class and above, you are, by the world historical measure, wealthy. You have plumbing. You have electricity. You have air conditioning in the summer. You have heat in the winter. You have comfortable furniture. You have technology. You have grocery stores and restaurants. You have what, just a few generations ago, the richest and wealthiest and powerful people did not have, simply because it did not exist. So if you live in the United States in 2023, and you are middle class and above, you are rich. And there's nothing wrong with having those comfortable things if your priority is Jesus Christ. If you genuinely prioritize Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and your Lord, he comes first. If he blesses you and has pretty much blessed everyone that I know that will be listening to this message is blessed in the way that I just described earlier. You all have those things that make your life very comfortable. There's nothing wrong with having those blessings. It is the priority. Do you prioritize the things of the world over Christ? Is your time and your effort put into gaining that which is going to pass away? I'm going to get to a verse later that Jesus is going to say, heaven and earth will pass away. So we, we, we don't want to be prioritizing the things that are passing away. We want to prioritize the lordship. We all want the salvation, but do we genuinely want the lordship of Christ in our church and in our individual lives, in our personal relationship with him. He says, uh, back in verse uh, one, he says, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. And if you go back to Revelation chapter one, verse five, uh, it, he, says, he says that uh, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. So he's, the, he's repeating what he said to, to John in chapter one, uh, faithful witness. He does not disappoint. When he says 
who he is and what he is and, and, and what his power is and what his authority is, when he says that, you can trust it. Faithful and true, genuine witness. The ruler of God's creation. Well, that kind of is easy to understand. Everything that is God's creation, he rules. He rules. So he is a faithful and true witness, but this church that he's addressing is not a faithful and true witness. This is the problem. So he's, he's, he's telling them that he's, he was in the beginning of God's creation. And we know from John chapter 1, uh, verse 3, that it says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Nothing. Nothing was made. Everything made is made by Jesus Christ. Well, what, what do you mean? The cars come out of the assembly line at the, at the, at the, you know, the car manufacturing factories. And, and you know, what do you mean he makes everything? The, the, the building blocks of all matter are made by Jesus Christ. The first protons, neutrons, and electrons that made the universe were made by Jesus Christ. There isn't anything that is made that wasn't made by him. And so he is defining who he is to this church. They need to hear who he is. They need to hear this before he gets into the critique, before he gets into the, the rebuke. In other words, know who's talking to you. Know who's talking to you. I know your deeds. Now, Christians love to say, people who, are, who say that they're a Christian. Christians and non-Christians alike love to say this phrase. I am a good person. Everybody loves to say that. That... That you can say, I am a good person, if you, you want to say, oh, I'm a good neighbor, I don't, you know, I don't steal from my neighbors, I, I help them when they need help. You can say that. But in God's eyes, the measure of good only applies to God. Man is evil, man is fallen, man is sinful. Uh, a man said, came up to Jesus and said, good teacher. And Jesus, before he could even ask the question, Jesus said, let me stop you right there. You're calling me good teacher. Only God is good. Man is sinful and falls short of the glory of God. When you say, I am a good person, you cannot equate that with I am a person of godly character, apart from Jesus Christ. I am a person of godly character. I am a, I am a holy person. I, 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 I exude righteousness and goodness. No, you don't. Now, if people do exude righteousness and goodness, it, it is because they have received Christ, and it is Christ in them that makes them righteous. It is Christ in them that makes them good. But no one is good apart from Christ. And so I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold, and a lot of, lot of discussion on what hot or cold means. And, and there are two interpretations of this, and they're both actually good, even though they're not the same. Uh, one is that uh, hot means that you are a genuine Christian. You, you, you genuinely, heartfelt, confess that you were a sinner, you recognized your lost state, you went to the cross, as it says in Romans chapter 6, you went to the cross, you died with Christ there, and he raised you up with himself. You, you, you died to the world, you died to yourself, you died to the devil. And, and, and it says in Romans chapter 6, if, if once you die from for something, you're freed from it. So if you died to sin, then you are freed from sin. And then you are raised, you are raised, not physically, we're raised spiritually. We're born again. 
We're a, we're a new creature. We're a new, we're a new person in Christ. If you have genuinely done that, if you have genuinely come to Christ, then you, some people say that's what hot means. And cold means, I've never done that. I, I, I admit I've never done that. I've never come to Christ. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Jesus. And some people say, well, that's what Jesus means by hot or cold. Either you're, you're a true believer or you're somebody that just acknowledges you've never been a believer before. And... The other interpretation is that um, Laodicea had two major aqueducts that uh, came into Laodicea. One was from a hot spring, one was from a cold spring. And so we all know that when we want cold water, when we want something cold, it's refreshing. We want it cold. We don't want it lukewarm. And when we want hot water. We want it hot. We want it for coffee or tea, or we want it for a hot bath or a hot shower. Uh, we want it for medicinal purposes. We want, we want hot. We, lukewarm does us no good. Besides that, luke, the, the lukewarm water coming into Laodicea was cold water that maybe you had traveled through, the, through a warm, you know, hot sun or whatever, and by the time it got to the city, it was, it was lukewarm, and it was also because of the, 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 the process of warming it, it was it, it smell, it was a, a sulfury smell. And, and you know, sul sulfur smells like rotten eggs, and so that's a reason to be nauseous. And same thing with hot water cooling off. And so Jesus uses, says something here he's never said anywhere else. We never look, we look in the Gospels, we look, we've never seen Jesus nauseous. He says, I spit you out of my mouth. The word is vomit, vomit you out of my mouth. How I wish you were either one of these. So either hot or cold, both being good, hot or cold, in the, in the aqueduct sense, or hot being a genuine Christian and cold, maybe Jesus pr prefers that you just admit that you are, that you, are, you don't belong to him. That, that could work here too. How I wish you were hot or cold because then if you're cold, then you know that you need him. But you're lukewarm. You think, you claim that you're a believer. You claim that your church, your church has a cross on it. You sing worship music. Sometimes the worship music isn't about Jesus. Sometimes the worship music is just some sort of music that pumps people up. And uh, the conversations in the church, when church is over, the conversations are about everything but Jesus. The church is lukewarm. And Jesus says, I, that makes me nauseous. I want to spit you out of my mouth. Matthew 7, 21 says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father. In, in, um, in, in another uh, gospel, I think it says that, that the people will say, you know, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Some people like to dismiss this and say, well, this is the Jews. Well, these are people that are standing before Jesus and they are saying, Lord, Lord, the Jews didn't acknowledge Jesus as their Lord. So this can't be the Jews. He's not talking about the Jews here that don't believe in Jesus. He's talking about people who claim they believed in Jesus. And they will say, Lord, Lord. And he will not, he will say, I, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, worker of iniquity. Well, you say, well, is that a murderer? Is that a thief? Is that a prostitute, worker of iniquity? Anyone who doesn't come to Christ is responsible for all of their sins. You're responsible for all of your sins. You have to come up with some sort of explanation as to why you didn't accept this great plan of salvation offered by Jesus Christ. You have to come up with a, a sacrificial atonement for your sins Otherwise, you, your, your iniquity 
you are still responsible for your iniquity. And he will say, you worker of iniquity. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The will of the Father in heaven is to come to Jesus. To come to Jesus, repentant, contrite. That's the will of the Father. This church has not done this. This Laodicean church has not done this. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Wow. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you are deceiving yourselves. If, you are, if you're a hearer only, Jesus will vomit you out of his mouth. Now, what does it mean to do? Be a doer. Well, if you love Jesus... You'll pray to him, you'll talk to him, and you'll listen to him. I, I know people, I've, I've asked people, I say, have you ever heard God speak to you? They say, no, I've never heard God speak to me. What, what do you think the scripture is? That's God speaking to you. Do you understand that when you read the words of Jesus, as I read these words of Jesus, Jesus is speaking to you now. The words of Jesus in the word of God is Jesus speaking to you. He is alive. He is present. He is speaking to you. Listen to him. Jesus will vomit you out of his mouth if you are apostate. They define their, their spirituality by worldly measures, monetary wealth, worldly comfort, pleasure, their pa and their passions, their obsessions are their first priority in their life. Pleasure and comfort and, and that, that sounds like Western culture. They do, not, they do not want help even from the Lord. They don't want help. Have you met people like this? I'll pray for you. No, that's no, okay. I got it. Well, you know, the, the word of God says, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. And yet Jesus says this. He says, <laughs> he says you say you're rich and you've acquired wealth and you don't, not need, anything, and you don't need anything. But you, 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 do not real, you do not realize, you do not realize that you are wretched and, and, and pitiful, miserable. Have we seen this? Have we seen this in our society, in our culture? People who have everything and they're not happy. They're wretched, they're, they're miserable. It's never enough. It's never enough. And it's interesting. I, we now see these very rich and powerful people. What are they doing to make themselves feel good about themselves, not coming to Christ? They're trying to be messiahs. They, they're trying to feed the poor, and they're trying to take care of the homeless, and they're trying to do... No, those aren't bad things. But if they're doing that in place of coming to Christ, they're still going to be miserable. Jesus is saying here, you have, not, you have not come to me. You've relied on your worldly wealth and your comfort and your pleasures. You have not come to me and you are wretched and you are poor. Now, Let's talk about the word poor because Jesus uses the word poor in a good way in Matthew 5, 3. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So not a bad thing if you're poor in spirit and you admit it and you realize that you're poor in spirit and you need Jesus. That's a good thing. But if you need to be rebuked by Jesus to find out that you're poor in spirit because you claim to be rich in spirit, that's not good. You're wretched and miserable and poor. You're poor in spirit. So come around and admit it. Lord Jesus, I am poor in spirit. I need you. I don't need the world. I don't need the flesh. 
I don't need the desires of the flesh. I don't need the devil. I need you. I need you. This is what Jesus is. He's working with not a, not a, a church that is, is like the Ephesian church or there, there's other churches in the book of Revelation. He works. This is a, an apostate church. This is a church that has nothing to do with him. And he's working with them. You see the love of God. We're going to see this later. And the, the, love, of, the love of Jesus for, for us is unimaginable. It's unimaginable. And, 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 you know, I haven't even started talking about his suffering and, on the cross and, 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 and dying on the cross for our sins and taking on the sin of the world and, and becoming sin for us, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and, and taking on the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13. That was the love of Christ. But here he's working with a church that is apostate and he's still working with them. But you do not realize that you're, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind. Well, blind. You just don't want to see truth. You just don't want to see truth. You, 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 you ignore it. You resist it. You resist the word of God. And therefore, if you're resisting the word of God, you are resisting Jesus. Jesus said in, in um, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You're bl if you're blind to the truth, you are resisting Jesus. That's what he means when he says they're blind. And naked. Now naked was an interesting place that the Lord took me in, in the scripture. Um, because I, you know, obviously this does not mean, okay, we're all born naked, so is, there's nothing wrong with being naked when you're born. You, we take showers and baths. We have to be naked for that. We have to be naked for surgeries, all right? So there's nothing wrong with being physically naked when it's appropriate, but um, just remember that Jesus sees the church as his bride. Many times in the New Testament, he calls the church his bride. Uh, I talk about that in the last message I gave last year about the imminent return of Christ has a, a lot to do with the bridegroom coming for his bride. So I, what I did was I, I looked in the Old Testament. I looked for, uh, and I knew this phrase existed, I just didn't know where. So I, I searched for her nakedness, her nakedness. And I found lots of scriptures in Leviticus in Ezekiel, in Lamentations, in Hosea. And basically, this is a nakedness that it elicits immoral and sinful behavior. Immoral, sinful, worldly pleasures, like an immoral wife. Like the bride is being immoral. Is naked means immoral. So this is the church being immoral. The church not being the bride of Christ, the church trying to seduce and trying to be seduced by the world. That's what it means here to be naked. You are blind and naked. Have we seen churches like this? They, there's no difference. There's no difference between what they believe and what other, relig other non-Christian be religions believe, what, what atheists believe. They, they believe in a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 new age stuff. Power of the mind. They're, 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 they're seducing and being seduced by the world. They're naked. Jesus uh, said in, in, I'm sorry, the Paul, Paul said to the, um, the church in Thessalonia, in, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he says, the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. So the, the, the lawless one, the spirit of Antichrist is very, very present. If you can't see that in the world, then you're blind. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world. And it is, it is deceiving, 
and there's, there's every kind of wicked deception directed against people who are perishing, make sure they perish. Because they refuse the love of the truth. They refuse the truth that comes from Jesus Christ that would have saved them. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, now the Spirit expressly states that in the later times, some will abandon the faith to follow deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, influenced by hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. Boy, that's a lot of, a lot of descriptive things there. Deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. I think we can see that in society today. I think we can see that. What, is, what are most churches doing about this? Many of them are embracing this. Embracing things that are clearly violations of scripture. Clearly. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having nothing to do, have nothing to do with such people. Paul is saying to Timothy, have nothing to do with such people, and yet we see such people in churches that claim to be Christian churches. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What is denying its power? What does that mean? So I, um, I, I looked up Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm sorry that it's not on there to be seen on the, on the bottom of the screen there. Uh, so Paul says to the Roman church, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then to the Gentiles. It is the power of God. It is the power of God. Having a form of godliness and denying its power, you look like you have a form of religious Belief, you have a form, you, you, you're presenting like an actor, you're presenting that you belong to the church. But you deny the power, the power of salvation, the gospel, being ashamed of the gospel denies the power of salvation. Being ashamed of the gospel denies the power of salvation, denying its power. You only have a form of godliness, you're just acting. This is why Jesus will say, you know, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, some of you are saying, well, Joe, this is condemnation. You're, you're really laying it on thick. Well, first of all, I think that I am substantiating everything I'm saying by scripture. So that's my first response to that. But second of all, condemnation. Condemnation. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. I am addressing people that are not in Christ. And for those who are not in Christ, there is condemnation. So you know, if you want to, if you want to pull Romans 8:1 and say, Joe, there's no condemnation in Christ, well, good. Of course there isn't. If you're in Christ, you're not gonna, you're not condemned. I am talking to those of you who may not be in Christ. And that could even be some of you church leaders out there. If you're not teaching the scripture the way Jesus wants you to teach the scripture, you're compromising it, that's apostasy. 
That's apostasy. Let me tell you some characteristics of apostasy. False teaching in the church. The world loves it. The world celebrates when, oh, this guy, he says there's no hell. Great. We don't have to come to Christ because there's no hell. That's apostasy. There is a hell. And it was created for the devil and the fallen angels. But if you reject so great a salvation, that is where you will end up for all of eternity, as, the, as I shared with you earlier. False teaching in the church cannot be found in Scripture. You, I, I, I challenge you to find where God calls everybody good people. You're all good people. You're, you're just so wonderful. I just, I, 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 no matter how you behave, no matter what you believe, I'm taking you into my, my, my eternal presence for all of eternity. I challenge you to find a scripture that says that. There aren't any. There aren't any. Sometimes false teaching is so confusing they, they, they state a premise, and then the explanation is so confusing that people just say, well, I'll just go with the premise because I couldn't understand the explanation. <laughs> yeah, people do that. You know, it's like, I, I, I couldn't. You know, this guy was talking about investing in his company. I didn't understand what his company was about, but I'm going to give him $10,000 and invest in his company because he said it was going to, you know, it's going to. Now, you, you, have to, you have to know what they're saying. Don't believe the premise of anything that's not scriptural because you don't understand. You think, well, you, I, I'm just not smart enough to understand the explanation of this heresy. Confusing by design so that people will just accept the premise. That's false teaching. Hypocritical. How many times do we see people on TV Say, well, you know, Jesus wants you to, you know, share you with, with your, you know, people who are in need. And, and they're, meanwhile, they're accumulating all their wealth to themselves. They're not sharing anything. Oh, you know, Jesus wants you to be faithful to your wife. They're cheating on their wives. Jesus doesn't want you to, you know, the homosexual lifestyle is sinful. And yet they're homosexual. We, we, we see this in the news all the time. Hypocritical. Now, so then there are some of you that are listening that are saying, oh, I, I, I struggle with sin every day. So do I. I struggle with sin every day. We're not talking about struggling with sin. We all struggle with, with, with temptation, with sin. We live in an environment that is constantly tempting us with sin. That is not apostasy. That is the process of sanctification. We, we fail Jesus. We go to Jesus with a contrite heart. We confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we continue to live for him. And that is what you should do. You should not allow the sin that you commit to, to take you away from a life in Christ. If I, if I stood here and said that, oh my gosh, I, I live a perfect life for Jesus, just, I'm, I'm an apostate. I'd be a heretic, okay? Nobody does. And that is what is so wonderful about our Savior. Our Savior is, is gracious and merciful and patient and forgiving. Yes, but you have to come to him for those things. You have to come to him for those things. You don't get those things because you're entitled to get them. You have to come to the cross. Please read Romans chapter 6 because there is a very good explanation broken down, unpacked about what happens at salvation. You go to the cross. You die to self. You die to the world. You die to the devil. And you are born again. You are raised with Christ. If you have not, if you've just recited a prayer that you didn't know what you were saying, or you just think because you come to a church you're a Christian, but you really never, never personally accepted Christ, then you need to, you need to do that. 
And then there's no condemnation in Christ. And then there is love and there is forgiveness and there is grace. What is the church? The church, Jesus says that the church is on a narrow road. Narrow is the road to salvation. It's not wide. The church is not a popularity contest. Now, I know many of you, and I've said this to many of you, I've looked up statistics. These are round numbers. I could be off by a few million, but in the United States, 150 million people claim to be Christians of all the different denominations. 150 million people claim to be Christians. Does this country look like there's 150 million Christians that love Jesus, love the word of God, that are praying every day because they love to pray, not because it's required and because I have to do it, because they love Jesus. They love talking to him. They love listening to him. They love fellowshipping with other believers because they love the topic of Jesus. They love the presence of Jesus. They love the presence of the Holy Spirit. They love the accountability. They, they love the fellowship. There are 150 million Christians like that in the United States? I don't think so. Two billion Christians in the world. <laughs> That's the same argument. Does this world look like there's two billion Christians? It's a narrow road. The church is persecuted and hated by the world. Persecuted and hated by the world. If you read 2 Peter, the whole chapter of 2 of 2 Peter, Peter has, there's no tolerance for apostasy in the church. No tolerance whatsoever. It's not like, well, you know. He's not talking about pers- you know, struggling with, 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 with temptation and things like that. He's talking about false teaching. No tolerance for that. If we go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, we see that who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. So when you deny the deity of Christ. No one, den- who, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's 23. If you, if you, I, I've met so many people, oh, well, Jesus was, you know, he was a son of God, you know, and, and of course, we're called sons and daughters of God, but he was a different, he was, he was not, the, the, by definition, what we are as a son of God. He was the true incarnate of God. He, he was God in the flesh. He was called the Son in the Trinity, and we're going to talk about the Trinity in a second. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. And I, 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 I can not explain in a way that you will fully comprehend what this Trinity is. But that is a, the Trinity is something that we believe as Christians, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And the Holy Spirit is God. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is, is not from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is. So already in the world. So if you, uh, you just think that Jesus was this good teacher, but it wasn't God. It wasn't God in the, come, in, come in the flesh. You are, that's an apostasy. That, and and there, are, there are people, there are churches, there are, there are church leaders that teach that Jesus was, was, was a man. That's an apostasy. There, there, Peter, in 2 Peter 2, like I said, no tolerance for that. If we look at, at 2 John, verse 7, it says, Say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. This is, this is when Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea, these are all the qualities 
They, Jesus, what we're going to see in verse 20, he's not even in the church. He's outside the church. He, he says, uh, and I have, you could look up, I'm not going to do these now in the interest of time, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, and, and Jude, verses 17 through 19. They all say the same things about the characteristics of, 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 of churches, of false teachers, of apostasies. But Jesus then says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. Now the only other place that we see gold refined in the fire, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Now I believe that this is talking about the, the, the judgment of believers after once believers are, are, are taken up into heaven and they stand before Jesus, they are judged, their works are judged. They're not judged for salvation because salvation was a gift, was given to them by, grace, uh, by, by the grace of God through the Christ's death on the cross and their faith in that. So they're, 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 not, they're not being judged to be saved. Their, their works are being judged. And he says, if anyone, in, 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 uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, I counsel you to buy from me gold. What, when we go to, second, when we go to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we see salvation in verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you are saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 says this, we are his workmanship created for good works in Christ. So the good works follow salvation. And what Jesus is saying is this, I counsel you to, to come to me, put your faith in me, and then do the good works that come from salvation. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. In, in Corinthians 13, it says the gold, the silver, and the precious stones go into the fire and they come out because they survive the fire. The wood, hay, and stubble, the works that are not done in Christ, burn up. That's, what it, that's what's taught in, in 1 Corinthians 3. Matthew 6.20 says this, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where the moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Probably today we could include where hackers can't get into your bank accounts and empty them. Store your treasures up in heaven. What, what treasures? What treasures are we to store up in heaven? Well, he says in Matthew chapter 24, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So what treasures? The word of God is your treasure. The word of God, as you, as you meditate on one truth after another, after another, after another, and it becomes part of your faith, it becomes part of who you are, it will never be taken from you for all of eternity. God's word will never pass away. Once you have it, your body will pass away. Your home will pass away. Your car will pass away. This earth will pass away. But whatever you have from the word of God will be your eternal treasure. Store up treasures in heaven. He says, he says, uh, you will become rich. White clothes you will wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. So in other words, the, 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 instead of being seduced by the world and su seducing the world, you put on the, 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 the light of Christ. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. The only way that the light is stopped is by covering your own light. The darkness can't stop the light. Jesus says, don't hide your light under a basket, under a bushel. Put on light. And put salve in your eyes so that you can see. That would be 
the salve to, to allow you, the Holy Spirit empowering you to understand the word of God so that you can see the truth. You're no longer blind to the truth. Clothed in life by the truth, by the Holy Spirit, the word of God. He is, he is loving the church here. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Now repent means, that doesn't mean just acknowledge what you've done. And I know that we've been taught this many times. Repentance means a, turning 180 degrees. I'm doing this. This is not what God wants me to do. I'm going to do this. This is what God wants me to do. This is, I'm, I'm believing this. This is not what God wants me to believe. I'm going to believe what God wants me to believe and only what God wants me to believe. Repent. So be, and be earnest when you repent. Don't just repent to get fire insurance. You repent because you love the Lord, because you appreciate what he's done for you, and because you know he loves you. Here I am, Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is not in this apostate church. And he is not in the life of this type of apostate believer. He stands at the door and knocks. There was a very famous picture of, of this verse. Some artist, uh, I don't know the name of the artist, I'm sorry, um, that uh, drew Jesus, uh, uh, painted Jesus standing at a door, okay, and knocking. And if you look closely at the detail of the painting, there's no handle, door handle, doorknob on the outside of the door. The door has to be opened from the inside. Jesus will not break the door down to your, to your life or to your church. He will not break the door down. You have to let him in. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is saying that I will become one with you, and it gets better. I will become one with you. When, when you, in that culture, when you ate with somebody, you became one with them. You let Jesus into your life, you let Jesus into your church, he becomes one with you in your life, he becomes one with your church. Wouldn't that be wonderful if 150 million people in this country became one with Jesus Christ, if two billion people in the world became one with Jesus Christ, the, the, the country, our country and the world would look very different. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He's, he's not talking to the apostles here, although the apostles will sit on thrones next to Jesus. He's talking to an apostate church. He's talking to an apostate church that, that rejects him. And he's saying, if you overcome, I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on my throne. Are, are you overwhelmed by that? I am. This is what Jesus will do if we overcome, if we repent, if we obey, if we make him our Lord. If any man hears the word of God and obeys it, then they've heard Jesus' voice. That's what he says. He says, who, who, whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. I'm overwhelmed by the love of God. I, I'm just, uh, how he is so forgiving, he's so merciful. Are you convicted today? And if you're, if you're still not convicted, please, please, those of you who are convicted, pray for those who are not convicted. If you're convicted, hear his voice, open the door. And if you, if you are saved, but you've, you've been away from the Lord, repent. Get right with the Lord. Because it says, he who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is, this is to the individual. He is an individual. If you, if you hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, let him in. 
is this world really worth what it's offering? Is what this world is offering really worth it? I think we have enough information to show us that what the world is offering is disappointing. And when you see a church going in that direction, going in the direction of what the world is offering, it's disappointing to Jesus. It's nauseating to Jesus. I hope that there is a revival in the church. I hope that there is conviction, confession, repentance. I hope people start praying like they've never prayed before. Pray according to the word of God. Involve the word of God in your prayer. I hope that home Bible studies start overflowing. I hope that people come to Christ and, and, and we see a revival, like some of the great revivals, the Scot Scotland revival, the, the revival that happened in the, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s. To, whom, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this rebuke. Thank you for loving us. By the power of your spirit, help us to appreciate who you are. Help us to appreciate your authority. You're the creator of the universe. And yet you humbled yourself and gave yourself for those you love, becoming sin, taking on the curse of the law for us, even when we ignore you, even when we reject you, even when we rebel against you, you love us, you love us, you love us. Lord, I pray that this message will go out into the world and convict, bring people to fear you, bring people to glorify you, bring people to worship you. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.